I need my white police officers not to be racist. I don't need to change the demographic. The society had, had welcomed me into this country, right? I'm unsure as to where, where I'm supposed to have been welcomed from. Secret courts? Yeah, we have secret courts here in the UK. Like, you can't see the evidence against you. The conspiracy theory, yeah? I was like, why are you asking me that question? Like, yeah. you know, I said, it's because I'm Muslim. Specifically said in court that we had no reason to suspect it. No. Yeah, yeah, the, the police officer said in court. You don't take a knife and stab somebody nine inches, pull it back six inches and call, call it progress. You know, hummed it over the course of the year, I managed to read 170 books. What? Uh, you, so, I've met one of those journalists before in real life. I speak English at level that he will never achieve in his life. Both selector. Okay. So when you ask questions like that, it's a weird way of kind of like exceptionalizing me. You know, I think that's quite problematic and maybe you should think a little bit about yourself when you ask questions like that. Assalamu alaikum guys. Welcome to another episode of Declassified. this in my files I keep files on them I've gone a bit high class now and cut out the riffraff the Umarisas and the Dili Husseins and we've gone a bit we've gone a bit upmarket we have today a human rights lawyer co-director at Cage he's done appearances on BBC Channel 4 he's done a masters he's done a masters he's currently pursuing a PhD finished. oh you've done it mm. Smashed it, mashallah. <laughs> He's a researcher and advisor on counter-terrorism practices. He's the author of this wonderful book. And most importantly, he's voluntarily bold. Asim, pleasure, bro. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's really nice to meet Ali Dawa. <laughs> no, Ali Dawa is he's the, the Turkish bloke here. I'm, I'm not Ali Dawa. Oh, I kind of made time for Ali Dawa. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah How long have we tried to get this podcast? Yeah, it's been a couple of months Yeah, I want to put this out there bro Honestly he, The brother did not suggest For me to buy the book Yeah, I literally said Look, we're going to do the interview It would be nice to get You know a, a free copy of the book He didn't hesitate He sent it to me And I felt it would only make sense For me to read the whole thing And bro, I, I have to say it's blown me away. Uh, there's so much I've learned from there. You mean there. that in a non-terroristy way? Right? I mean that in the most non-terrorist, uh, I'm sorry, MI6, <laughs> MI5 sort of Just way. Just to clarify Just, the audience. And there's big words in here that were a big problem for you, bro. Uh, and the fact is, on your front cover, you've got a, CIA, a former CIA officer to say that your book is thought-provoking. Uh, I would definitely urge you to buy it. This is a must. Yeah, because the brother's been working in this field for how long now? Uh, 16 years. 16 years worth of experience that's gone into this book. It's your second book, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Honestly, I feel like I've, I've sat with you for a week. Mm -hmm. that, that's the beauty, I think, that, that books have. We're going to start off, bro. Mm -hmm. Very simply. What do you do day to day? And why do you do it? You know, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm the research director of uh, your advocacy group, CAGE. What we do is that we help individuals um, and communities understand um, the impact of this thing known as the global war on terror, which basically means that after 9-11, countries around the world decided that they were worried about the threat of terrorism, particularly from Muslims. And so they instituted or put into effect policies and legislation that largely impacted Muslim communities in a specific way. So we started off trying to highlight that, but then moved into actually helping the individuals who are suffering at the hard end of these things. So we do a lot of casework in the office too. Uh, and what do you mean by casework? So somebody will come to us and they'll say, you know, I was going through Heathrow Airport and I got stopped and they were asking me all these weird questions about you know, what my views on Palestine are and, and so on and so forth. 
And so then we help that individual first to understand what they've been through, but then also to see if there's any way that we can help to challenge the, the you know, the, what they've experienced. What would you say to someone that says, I don't need to worry about this because I'm a law abiding Muslim? Yeah, who just minds his own business. And uh, why would I risk getting my door kicked in and getting into this stuff where I can just just live my life? Well, I think the important thing to remember is that the vast majority of people uh, who are arrested, who are, um, you know, kind of questioned by the police, who are being harassed by MI5, who are getting stopped at airports, um, none of them are terrorists in the grand scheme of things. Like maybe they might find one person here mm. or another person there. But the 50,000 people that were getting stopped at Heathrow or Gatwick as they're flying in and out, largely Muslim. 50,000? Yeah, per year. Um, it's, the numbers have reduced slightly, but that's also because they changed the way that they uh, register who's being stopped. So if you get stopped less than 15 minutes, they don't record it anymore. No way. So, so now they've changed. That's kind of, crap, They've right? fudged the statistics a little bit, right? Oh. But yeah, it used to be as much as like 50,000. Who's they? Right? The uh, they got, yeah, I mean the, the border agency, right? Oh. So the home office. I thought it was the Illuminati. No, I'm not sure, so sure about that. But okay. uh, right now we can deal with the border agency <laughs> at least anyway, right? Yeah, let's start <laughs> slowly, guys, yeah? yeah. Calm down. <laughs> this is part of a process of criminalization, right? Because they keep that data then on you as well. But why should they? Because they themselves say that there's no reason to suspect the person. It's just purely a profiling exercise. Even when they stopped my colleague Mohammed Rabani uh, a couple of years ago, they specifically said in court that we had no reason to suspect him. No. Yeah, yeah. The, the police officer said in court that we had no reason to suspect him for anything. We just stopped him. And that was, what was the response to that of, of the people that were there? The, well, I think most people just... Did the lawyers? I think most people accept it, right? Because I think wider society is willing for us to pay the price for them to feel safe, right? Because, but they don't think when about... When you say us... As in the Muslim community, right? Because the, largely we're the ones who are being impacted and affected by these policies, right? Because back in the days, I used to see people and I used to be like, yeah, come on, don't take it too hard. But when you look into this stuff, bro, it affects you. Right. And and it's difficult, and, and you you can't unsee it. Right, you can't, you can't unlive it. <laughs> yeah. You're with the family. Yeah, they want to go out or whatnot. You're going out, but your yeah. mind is it's, right. It's right. still there. Right. It's. I think it's the thing that probably my um, my wife says to me most often, which is, "You're here, but you're not here." Right. Yeah, bro, I'm I get that, that a lot, uh, and because obviously it's it's difficult. You can't. There's no off button. Yeah. Right. And actually, even somebody said it to me not too long ago. We were at a wedding, and uh, we were having a conversation about movies, and then I was giving an analysis of certain problems with a certain movie. He goes, "Bro, don't you ever just switch off?" Switch I was off. like, "I don't, I don't have the capacity to switch off, because, you know, my life is so much lived." in kind of the realm of other people suffering right or not other people suffering even other people surviving right they're mm. survivors they're heroes and you know it's it's their stories of really kind of moving beyond such difficult things that helps you just kind of like just sit back a second and just say okay right like you know that hardship hasn't come into my life you know it hasn't come into my life uh in in a way that um I see around me all the time. And so, like, shouldn't I be a little bit, you know, kind of humble towards that? I'm sitting there interviewing this brother who's held in solitary confinement for 13 years of his life, mm. right? And, you know, we're talking and talking and talking and we're talking about hardship, right? And he said, you know, subhanAllah, sometimes... And we're talking about the Qur'an and in, in, in his time in prison, like reading the Qur'an. And uh, he says, you know, sometimes I think to myself that I look at the brothers who were in Guantanamo and, you know, the people who went through the CIA torture program and I read their stories and I think to myself, how much of a weak Muslim must I be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sought to test me but not test me with the kind of torture that they went through? Mm. And I actually broke down. I was just like, I can't take this. 13 years in solitary confinement is no joke. One week in solitary confinement is no joke. I know people who have literally kind of you know, gone to the very brink of breaking down just within a few days of being held indefinite, kind of incommunicado from the rest of the world. You know, I always say to people, I would, you know, I'd be happy to be detained most places in the world except for the US. 
and, and I'm not even talking about Guantanamo here, I'm talking about the US mainland, their prison system is so horrific, it's so abusive, that, you know, I, I don't understand how anybody could even survive being there for a single night. Nah, well, it's the US, is the stars and stripes, the land of the free, that, that surely that can't be the case. What what would be your what would be your evidence? Check out um, Arizona Prison Rodeo on YouTube. That sounds like one of those gourmet burger places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish it was, man. It's a, a yearly. Um, so I've never heard that before. Yeah, most people haven't. It's a yearly rodeo that takes place. So twenty thousand people, they buy tickets for this um, for this show. And it's basically um, games that have been constructed for the prisoners, whereby the prisoners can get certain um, privileges by taking no. part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bro, this is something from a movie. So, so for example, one of the games that they play, literally, if you went onto YouTube now, you could find probably the latest Arizona oh rodeo show. Oh, my God. They will have a table. This one's called Prison Poker. They have a table with four prisoners around the table. They all mock playing cards with one another. The winner is the last per- person who's still in his seat after they've released a ball into the pen that's throwing them up in the air. No. And you've got 20,000 people cheering their heads off and getting really excited about it and whatever. And it's just, it's abusive, it's harmful, it's very gladiatorial. Yeah, um, that's what I was going to say. Gladiator. Yeah, yeah basically. That's basically. Mad. And people say, oh, well, the prisoners have a choice about getting involved, right? Do they? But yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, you know, is it really a choice when, you know, we know that within the prison system in America that prison wardens effectively have life and death like control over the prisoners there they have 101 ways to to coerce them or induce them into doing things right so when you have a system like that then of course that whole idea the whole concept of of personal choice kind of vanishes a little bit bro in your book you describe islamophobia as racism Mm -hmm. uh i've always thought that islamophobia was discriminatory i didn't think that it could be put in the category of racism so usually people do associate um racism with like the superficial right so like how people look what the ethnicity is so on and so forth right but let's think of racism as a structure yeah that's more important in order to understand it because you and i can immediately understand when somebody hurls abuse at a person in the street gets up in their face and starts shouting you know kind of racial abuse at them or whatever that that's a form of racism But, you know, what we also need to understand that racism, when we think about it structurally, also applies when a judge gives a longer sentence or when the police stop a person in the street because they think he looks suspicious because of a preconceived profile that they have in their head Mm. about what that person looks like. Right. From from your interviews um, and and your book as well, one thing that that I really it was a breath of fresh air was you don't go with whatever said to you uh in the sense that mm-hmm. if if they say something you're going to question it you question words you question definitions if uh if if something's put out there you're going to track it down mm-hmm. the the example that's detailed in your book is uh, schedule 7 right. how you guys kind of follow um the documents all the way to the science that's behind it and then you dissect that mm-hmm. and it, it it caused loads of experts to look into it right and so my my question is that have you found this to be effective and and, and successful or and would you recommend others to do it as well so knowledge is power right um in my the conclusion to my book i i I talk about kind of three sites of disobedience that i think we should have Mm -hmm. and one of the the areas that i think we should be disobedient in is uh is in the way that knowledge is constructed to specifically harm us right because knowledge is not value neutral it can be something that is that can be for good and it can also be for evil as well so when somebody for example and we've had some of these discussions already says that Muslims are a threat to Western civilization or Western society, you have to then break down the numbers. You have to look, okay, fine. You say that we're a threat, but based on what? So turning back to the Professor Mark Sageman and his work, his statistical work 
on this, right? What does he find? He finds that the threat that's posed by Muslims in the West, which he includes as Australasia, um, uh, Western Europe, and North America, right? And Canada. He says that if we take the whole of the Muslim population from these countries combined, the threat amounts to one Muslim per year, okay? Out of the entire population of Muslims, which he puts at around, uh, I think, 25 million or something like that. So he says that ultimately, in order to find the one terrorist per year with all of these laws, you have to make uh, an unfortunate victim uh, something like 250,000 people a year, wrongfully. Mm. And his conclusion is that is an unacceptable margin of error by any stretch of the imagination that that number of people have to come under suspicion, have to be placed on a database, have to be stopped at a port, you know, have to have all of these things done to them in order for your overly excessive laws to achieve the thing that they're trying to achieve, right? And that's not going to be conducive to building a, a more, you know, kind of cohesive society. So I think that's, that's why it's so important that when people say stuff like, well, there is a threat from Muslims, right? It's just like, well, what do you mean by threat? Yeah. Like, do you feel like you are in, your life is at risk right now by being in proximity to one, two, three, ten Muslims, mm. right? Give us a number that you know, as a matter of fact, is causing your life to be at risk right now. Because the reality is, is that the numbers are, are, are so small because we take care of business in our own house, right? The reason why the numbers are small is because, guess what? We are still a community that has very, very strong ideas around obedience, around, um, you know, kind of sticking together, around family structures, around mm. community structures. If we're talking realistically, right? Yeah, then there's there's a lot that we can say. For example, every Muslim is very close with the whole Palestine and Israel issue. But when you're able to say, look, this is the problem that we have. What's the problem that you have? Well, why is the UK selling arms to Israel? For example, in 2015 to 2017, they gave about 320 million pounds worth of mm -hmm. arms to Israel. Why is it that it's currently at war with eight countries, killing people using drones like you mentioned, but this drone facility many people don't even know is in Menwith Hill? Uh, it's in Yorkshire, isn't it? Right. Yorkshire tea, Yorkshire pudding, Yorkshire drones. Right, exactly. Isn't it? Many yeah. people don't know. I didn't know. Yeah. I, I had to get it from David. I saw it in David Southwell's book. Mm -hmm. And then I looked into it. And then Guardian articles started popping up. And it's, they look really nice with the little cute golf balls and stuff. And also the fact that they, you know, they share data with five other nations, the, the five eyes. Um, and... Countries are being bombed from this country and this is what they fail to understand that when you do all of this sort of stuff It's like Jeremiah Wright when he said Americans chickens are coming home to roost Right, but what, um, what, what if someone's getting into this new because chances are mm -hmm. Some of the people watching they're gonna be like damn. I didn't know this stuff. So I have a blog called the books limist uh, where you know myself and a few others um, I co-edit it with uh, dr. Sadia Habib um, so yeah, what we do is that we, we constantly reflect on the books that we read and we put up short either reflections or longer reviews of, of each book. And nearly all of these books focus on kind of social justice issues, whether they're Islamic or not. And even if they're like, it's a work of fiction, what we're doing is we're trying to reflect, uh, on what are the themes in those books that are important for us to think about. Okay. So uh, a good example is Camilla Shamsi's Home Fire where she talks about things like ISIS. Is that about, fiction? Yeah, it's a fiction book. Um, she talks about ISIS. She talks about counterterrorism legislation in the UK. She talks about a lot of different uh, ideas, but they're very, very well presented throughout the book. So sometimes, actually, the best way to learn about what's, what's going on in an interesting way isn't even necessarily a non-fiction book. Sometimes fiction does that very well, okay. too. 2017, right? Uh, I took a sabbatical from Cage. I said, I just, you know, I'd been doing the work for about 15 years. Does that mean you got fired, yeah? Yeah, basically. <laughs> they found somebody better to do than, uh, the job than me, right? Uh, but no, I asked for some time off uh, from Cage's work, although somehow I still ended up being involved. <laughs> um, just to 
sit back and read and reflect. So, you know, Hamdullah, over the course of the year, I managed to read 170 books. What? Uh, you, uh, 170? Yeah, Alhamdulillah. I mean, I, I read. I told you I read. Mas- right? That's what I do. Ma- mashallah. <laughs> what? 170? Yeah. That's mm. mad, bro. It's, it was... That's brilliant. It was interesting. You know, it was definitely uh, something that opened my mind. Well, I mean, but specifically, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to just engage in in as wide a literature base as that I possibly could just to help think about, well, you know, what have I been doing for the last 15 years of my working life? You know, we're doing all of this work. No wonder, bro, in your book, there's, um, you have a lot of quotes in there. You've got George Orwell, you've got Martin Luther King, you've got Malcolm X. In in essence, reading your book shows the, the kind of diversity in reading that you've done. You've read read quite a bit. I think what happens uh, a lot of the time is that um, you know, and I, I do training sometimes for like Muslim communities, um, different groups, just about reading. And one of the questions I start with, I was just like, what type of books do you, do you like reading? And go around the room and everybody says. Comic and books. And often, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I read comic books too. Yeah. Okay. I'm you're saying probably, probably most no, 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 I read, Asians. Uh, you know, I like reading comic books as well. There's a lot you can learn from them. Um, but often what times what people say is that I like reading Islamic books, right? And I understand the sentiment that they're trying to... To, to give me, right? Which yeah. is that there are books that are Islamic. You've got to read books. the Quran, bro. Yeah, no, but you do. You've got to read the Quran, you've got to read the Hadith. You need to read the yeah. Quran every, you need to read Quran every single yeah. day, right? In fact, once I met Sheikh Jafar Idris and he, uh, and, you know, his, his bachelor's, master's and doctorate are all in philosophy. And I, and I said to him, I said, like, how is it that you, you didn't get so enamored by all this philosophy that you read? He goes, because I made a commitment to myself that every page of theirs that I would read, I would read a page of the Quran. Right, like the Quran tethers you, it it anchors you to to Allah effectively. So sometimes you can read some of this stuff and you think, wow, that's amazing. You read John Locke, you read Montesquieu, you read Tocqueville, all of these like philosophers, right? And you think, you read David wow. Williams, yeah, <laughs> yeah, David Williams is great too. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt he's a great author, right? Um, and and it seems a bit intoxicating what they're saying. We think, okay, that makes sense, right? But then the Qur'an just makes sense at a completely different level, mm. right? Because it reminds you that actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the beings that are talking about this stuff. Mm. Um, but what I try and say is that, look, we're not secularists. We don't differentiate knowledge in the sense that, oh, this is un-Islamic knowledge, right? Knowledge is knowledge. And what we do is that it's, it's something that either helps improve us or something that we must reject. Now I get what you what you're trying to say. It's it's important to understand your your surroundings. Yeah. So for du'at especially, right? Like again, we come back to this whole point of data and knowledge. As a, a as a day, what's the one thing that you want to know, right? Who's your audience? Like the Prophet was an expert at this. Like he knew and he catered for his audience all the time. Mm. So that's something that we know is is an important thing to do. Now guess what? In the fiction that why does society write? They don't just tell you about the world. They tell you about what's inside their hearts. They tell you about their fears and their loves and their interests and like everything wow. that is like the deepest parts of their minds. And they put it all down on paper. Yeah. Okay. If you don't, as a day, if you don't see that that is like knowledge that's important for you to read and understand then you're missing out on a lot actually Mm. because you know they reveal themselves they reveal themselves in a way that they wouldn't be willing to reveal themselves if they were talking to you directly wow that's a very unique way of looking at it i mean for me it's like it was the most obvious thing as i was reading this stuff because i was like subhanallah that these people really that their innermost frailties the stuff that makes them completely fragile and open to you right it's there it's in, the, in it's in these works your 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 thing your thing is humanitarian based yeah you you have a certain direction that you're going why is it that any time a muslim goes on there they have to be questioned on fgm they have to be questioned on this quote this thing taken out of context this the, the sort of typical sharia lines that's used to discredit that person Bro, how, how do we knock that down? And what do we do, man? Because that's infuriating to watch. Yeah, Matt, that, that Matt, Frey, yeah. Matt, Matt Frey's interview with me on Channel 4 News because we were literally talking about humanitarian intervention uh, on that one. And there's two people speaking. 
there's a, a woman on the screen and there's myself in the in the in the uh, in the studio and he says he turns to me and he says would you support a caliphate oh my god and i was like why are you asking me that question like yeah. you know i said it's because i'm muslim that's the i said you know i i take you know uh you know i have a big problem with what you're asking because it's islamophobic and then that really put his back off because you can't, you know, you're not, you know, I'm not being Islamophobic, so on and so forth, just answer the question, whatever. I said, no, I said, the, the point is that, you know, the only reason you're asking me that question is because I'm a Muslim. The reason they asked that question is because they want to discredit everything that you say, because, again, it comes back to why, why I believe Islamophobia is, is, is part of racism, because what we believe, how we think, who we are, for them taints everything about us then right so if you're somebody who believes completely in the authenticity of the quran and the son of the prophet sallam, as being the most important things in your life right that then taints everything about you because you are not somebody who um is willing to put the secular idols that they've put into place as the ultimate sources of authority in, in your life right that for them is is deeply concerning because, you know, you don't take your point of authority from the same place they do, which means that they see you as an outsider now. Okay, oh, well, you can't, you're not permitted to enter this conversation until you have transformed yourself to being exactly what, what we want you to be. Mm. Which is why they will expedite the process of granting uh, uh, asylum to a Saudi girl who renounces her religion yeah. and ends up in, in, in Canada, right? Over, you know, the millions of other refugees that are out there who are Muslim or non-Muslim who don't bring that same value, okay? Because for them, this is like symbolic. All right, so your book is called Virtue of Disobedience. Mm -hmm. Now, the question that I'd like to ask is disobedience against whom? <laughs> Or who? Um, Whom? Who? Have you have you decided which one you want to go? Which one is it? Both are correct. Oh. <laughs> yeah. okay. Whom is uh, unfashionable now? Uh, it's very posh, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 seen that way. That's right. So it's kind of almost becoming extinct now, unfortunately. Yeah. So the book the book comes. Uh, it started from a Jummah khutbah. If you don't mind, give me some back backstory about it. Uh, I was sitting in the Jummah Khutbah with my, with, my, uh, uh, with my two older boys and the Imam, he starts talking about obedience to the state and that as Muslims we have a duty to be obedient to the state and I was like, I was fine with this idea, right? Like, yeah. I was like, okay, fine, yeah, I, I get that like, you know, I got all the arguments about, you know, Dal Akht, you know, that we have a contract and so on and so forth, right? With uh, whatever land that we live in and then he went on and he started extending the argument. He goes, even if they oppress you, you have a duty to be obedient towards them, right? And then he extended it even further. He goes, even if the police, who are the servants of the state, even if they oppress you, even if they brutalize you, you cannot demonstrate against them because demonstrating against them is kufr, right? Whoa. And at this point i was losing it right but yeah. i don't want to set a bad example to my kids and walk out of the juma khutbah you know you know it's important that they still understand that there is a, a decorum that that is required when you are sitting in that in that moment so i don't want to give them the, the wrong message yeah. in fact although i watched one brother like walk out like directly in front of me <laughs> as he was saying this and I was like in my heart I was just like yes brother you go <laughs> you do that right? The power. <laughs> right right so but it was the first time that I had left a khutbah and like I was actually physically shaking a little bit when I was sitting in my car because I was just so upset not because of what I had heard because I've heard these arguments before but I was upset for my kids that they had heard it and I was particularly upset because of the conversation that I needed to have with them which is the first time that I said to them that I imams don't always get it right. That was a really hard conversation for me to have because, you know, that relationship is so sacred. It's so important that they understand that I am uh, held at a level that, you know, that we revere. Yeah. So I said to them that, look, you know, what he was saying there about 
us not demonstrating when you know we're brutalized or oppressed in some way okay i said that's not from our faith that's not from what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us i said if that was the case then he would never have given us the example of musa alayhi salam in the quran the ultimate truth speaker you know in front of the greatest tyrant that ever lived mm. you know and that's and that's why that night i went home and this was at the start of ramadan and every single night between uh qiyamul layl and fajr i would just sit there and like type thoughts to myself about what i'd heard it didn't this, this book didn't start off as a book it just started as a series of reflections to myself because i was so angry and so upset you know and it was in that year that i took sabbatical you know it was in the middle of that year that i was really i was engaged in reading all of this information and every single night and alhamdulillah by the end of ramadan i had finished the book which didn't even start off as a book right you just started so after you, you did this book in ramadan yeah 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 the whole book the whole book yeah alhamdulillah i mean the first the first draft of it obviously took a lot of uh, a lot of edits afterwards and uh, you know alhamdulillah but it was just was it the quotes and everything yeah like i mean because i told you i have my da- i have, I have my yeah. database don't i and so when i'm writing i'm literally just like throwing things in to my argument as i'm making it along because i know in the back of my mind the the, the, the information that i need so it's not that difficult a process alhamdulillah when i actually sat down to and re- as i said i it, it wasn't it wasn't a book when it started it was just me reflecting on myself wanting to know better what is it that the quran says to me when i'm thinking about all of these injustices that i see and of course because in the quran in ramadan you are so steeped in the quran on a daily basis mm. it almost felt like at every single moment where i was having a thought about something it happened to be on the very day i was reading those chapters of the quran right so, so even when i was thinking about um the whole notion of of racism and where racism comes from i was reading the ayat in the quran from uh, from surah baqarah about the creation of adam alayhi salam right and the fact that you know iblis rejects him because of his superficial existence which is this clay and it piece is like i'm better than him ultimately it's a racist argument wow you know like that's that's like the essence of it right that's mad it's just a purely racist argument like i'm better than him look at me look at him you know how can you compare the two of us whoa you know that's first time i've heard it described as a racist thing because it comes from arrogance right yeah. this is arrogant That's but mine. why is he arrogant? He's arrogant because he believes that his form is superior. Yeah. And that's why wow. you know for, for all races all races come across as what? They all come across as arrogant superior, because yeah. they have that superiority complex it about themselves. Because they're race, yeah. Right, right, exactly, you whites. know. So it all connects. And then when you then when you follow that through, you realize that oh my god, like actually so much of the harm that's come from this world has come from that that same arrogance from that same Ooh. kind of like superiority that these people feel that they have because of what because of something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them in the first place because mm. they didn't humble themselves to the fact that Allah made me this way and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one only one who gives us authority the only one who gives us izza right is him not not nothing by anything virtue of what we have done mm. because we're just the creation yeah. right so So ultimately this conversation started between what I was reading uh you know with all of these other books and the Quran and you know and you know somebody once said like I can't remember which author that if somebody hasn't uh, if you haven't read the book that you've always wanted to read then you should write it yourself right and it's kind of what ended up happening with this which is I always wanted to read somebody who would talk about racism who would talk about injustice who would talk about oppression that's going on in the wider world you know but do it through the lens of the Quran do it through the lens of being a muslim yeah. so everything whenever i quote any of the people that i do whether it's from fiction whether it's from non fiction or whoever i'm linking it back to the Quran in 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 every instance because yeah, i love that It's what anchors us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you had a very interesting encounter with the Daily Mail. You in your book you kind of take some valuable lessons out of that. For the people that haven't read your book, what would you say was the stuff that you learned from your encounter with them? 
So the Daily Mail, I think the thing that you're particularly referencing is something that they said uh, about me, which is um, that uh, I was I was thankless um, considering the society had had welcomed me into this country, right? And the line that I write is that, you know, I'm unsure as to where, where I'm supposed to have been welcomed from. Yeah, right? I love that bit. <laughs> and, 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 and that's because I feel very, very strongly <laughs> about this, right? Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't separate myself from the rest of society. What happens in society is my problem. You know, we had a conversation about what home means, yeah? This is home. If ever I'm forced to leave this country, I will be a refugee anywhere else in the world. I won't be going home to anywhere else. I'd have left my home and ended up somewhere that, you know, has, has taken me in as a refugee mm. from my home. Okay. That's very important for me, at least anywhere, just at a personal and very psychological level. Like people have this discussion about whether or not you can be British and Muslim and so on and so forth. Right. And for me, that's like, it's, it's, it's a bit of a nonsense argument for me, at least anyway, because you put me on a desert island somewhere. I will still find a way of queuing on that island for the things that I want and that, that I need. I will still be as sarcastic as I am. I will still gesticulate and intonate and say words and phrases and use popular culture references that I know from my experience. You know, when they say to me that I'm supposed to be welcome from somewhere, I disagree with that for a start. And it's interesting when you see that anybody who stands up to the state, anybody who speaks up against the state, they get the same treatment. So Coloured. Always. Yeah. So Afua Hirsch, the, uh, the black journalist, she's half Jewish, half black. When she wrote some articles that were very critical about um, the state of racism in the UK today, the Daily Mail said about her that, you know, she should be more grateful for being here. When Stormzy criticized Theresa May's government over Grenfell, again, they did this hit piece on him where they said, you know, you know, he should be more grateful considering his family were welcomed into wow. this country, right? So it's not just me, yeah. right? This is, again, that's why, like, we go back to the whole Islamophobia racism concept, right? Yeah. It's actually something that gets deployed frequently. And for me, like, literally, as I was writing that chapter, okay, in the book, I came upon the verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, Musa alayhi salam being sent to Fir'aun, right? And he sent to Fir'aun and, and holds Fir'aun to account and says like, you know, he says, you know, let the children of Israel grow, you're impressing them, so on and so forth. Fir'aun says, hold on a second. Weren't you the one who grew up in our, in our household is this the favor that you now ask of me? Wow. You know, and I thought it's exactly the same response. Whoa. This big oppression is going on, right? This, this problem, this racism, this tyranny is going on in society. So you highlight that. And what the power structure says is, hold on a second. Why are you talking about that? I welcomed you here. I yeah. gave you sanctuary. We feed I you. gave you relief. So don't talk about this stuff when I am responsible, right? When I'm responsible for your safety and your sanctuary and your being brought up in my land. It's, it's ironic because the two guys who wrote the piece against me, one had a Polish surname and the other one had an Italian surname. Wow. So it also tells you a little <laughs> bit about their own internal logic, right? About who they see as an outsider versus an insider. I've met one of those journalists before in real life. I speak English at a level that he will never achieve in his life. Both okay? selector. Like, th th this is just a reality, right? I'm not saying that people who can't speak English like this aren't Shots or whatever fired, else. Like, but, Shots fired. But, like, if you want to go there, and if you want to start using markers Ooh. that are superficial for how Burn you understand it, belonging and whatever else, then I'm literally eviscerating you on every single metric Ooh. you can think of, right? It's stupid, because it doesn't make any sense, right? Ooh. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever that we should use these these kinds of markers to understand who belongs and doesn't. Quite frankly, I think the whole idea of nationalism is stupid anyway. Like that's just like, and we can go down that route if you want. And I talk about it a bit in the book, but like the whole notion that some people are more deserving by virtue of the lot, by Allah's finance out as a decision about where they're born, right? It's like complete insanity. 
you know, from one bold guy to another bold guy. Yeah, you got Sajid Javed. Yeah, <laughs> that walking, you know, catastrophe. He's now the home secretary of this nation. People are happy the fact that we've got a brown guy that's yeah. in in parliament. But I don't know, bro. I don't mean this in any offensive way possible. But I hope to offend as much as possible. <laughs> Which is, he seems like the ultimate definition of a coconut, bro. Or Uncle Tom, or a whatever you want to call it. Now, and, bro, I just, what's your opinion with regards to people like Sajid Javed, who do make it in these positions? Are they Uncle Toms? Are they coconuts? Or, or what's the deal with these guys? So I think this comes down to, like, ideas around representation, right? Like, we're always... A lot of people are always talking about representation. Like we need more representation of Muslims in certain areas. I know I'm not necessarily against that, right? Yeah. That that could be a good thing, but I don't think that's the solution to mm. everything. Like often I get into debates with people, and they say, "Well, if we had more Asian and Muslim police officers, then there'd be less institutionalized racism." I'm like, you guys aren't getting the point. The point is that I need my white police officers not to be racist i don't need to change the demographic uh, of the okay. police in order to st- you know to stop that from happening white people should just learn not to be racist why are we putting the emphasis on <laughs> us for their racism yeah right yeah, true. it's like it's it's such a stupid <laughs> argument for me yeah. in so many ways um and sergeant the bed in so many ways is indicative of that because you know they 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 you know, I, I, and I, I use the word weaponize specifically. They weaponize his Muslim heritage and background when it suits them to say, well, look, here's a, a somebody with Muslim background who made it, right? And he's come to the thing. Look how open we are and whatever else, right? Yeah, but by the time he got there, he left behind every single semblance by the time he got there of, of that Muslim heritage that he had, mm-hmm. right? Like he's, there's a person who's gone on record to say that the only religion that, that is practiced in my household is Christianity. Whoa. So how is he an example of Muslim excellence and Muslim representation when the one thing that he know, offers is, is Christianity is, 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 is crucial to the Muslim element yeah. is the Islam bit. Right? Yeah. If today, mm-hmm. because it's very interesting learning law, but what people don't understand or fail to understand, correct me if I'm wrong, which is if you get stopped as a potential threat under the terrorism legislation, is it true that you technically have no rights? The law itself, as it's constructed under terrorism legislation, is, you know, the only word I, I've got for it is unconscionable. It goes against the conscience of rightly minded people. The law is illegal. The law is immoral. And that is why we should never be a people that accept scraps. You know, Malcolm X once said, you don't take a knife and stab somebody nine inches, pull it back six inches and call, call it progress. Whoa. Okay. That is such an important standard by which we should understand how we are affected by this legislation. So when they say, when Tony Blair says, I want 90 days detention without charge, pre-charge detention, right? So we can, they can hold you for 90 days in a police station before they've even charged you with a crime, mm-hmm. okay? That's what he wanted. People campaigning against it, campaigning against it, right? They managed to get it down to 28 days. Human rights organizations out there, they actually um, patted themselves on the back when they managed to defeat 98 days and, and, and get it down to 28 days because they said that's such a success, at Cage, we were like, that's a complete disaster. Can you imagine what happens when you get locked up for 28 days? Can you imagine what that does to the person? I talk about this in the book. Your life is devastated in 28 yeah. days, right? It's devastated in seven days. Tony Blair, before he came to power, in the context of Ireland, said that seven days pre-charge detention was completely against the conscience of the law. That seven days, right? And that was before he came into power. Wow. Right, he was against seven days, and he he was the one who was trying to bring ninety days in. So we have an environment where we're constantly sold by liberals this idea that as long as we build certain safeguards and human rights compliant safeguards into this horrible legislation that exists that largely only impacts us, then it's acceptable. Mm. But w- when did we become a people 
that had such low standards of what we felt was acceptable to apply to us. And that is my huge problem with liberals in particular. I write about that in the book, but also elsewhere, that liberals help us to die a very slow death because <laughs> what they do is that they you know, effectively collaborate with the administration to give us a human, a human rights compliant version of our oppression. Mm. So now it's difficult enough, bro, to get our kids to read and be educated and come out of this whole entertainment industry, yeah, to put down the remote and pick up the book. Mm. Now, bro, what's made it worse is we have to now be checking the books now as well. Yeah. And the education system. Yeah. Oh, bro, is there a solution to that? Like, what, what do we do? Because well, two things, right? Yeah. Um, we need to read wider than we do because there are lots of people who are writing alternative histories out there. Uh, we shouldn't just, just because the big publishing houses are publishing um, certain individuals, it doesn't mean that that person is now the authority on the subject. It means that person had the access and the privilege to be able to write that, right? But there might be a smaller publishing house that is writing an alternative history that's just as well evidence and probably provides a more accurate assessment of whatever that history is, right? Mm. So there's, you know, there's lots of other ways of getting around it. I do recommend that people read the the, the literature that their children read uh, because there is a lot of stuff in there that is obviously very wrongful-minded and you have to be careful about what it is and how they interact with it and what it means for them as well. And you should be ready to have those conversations with them if you want to give. So that brings me on to the point because what's very interesting is a lot of people don't know that the UK is actively um, supplying weapons to a lot of these countries that are supposed enemies, first of all. Number two, what was very interesting was that the UK actually allows certain citizens to come in and out of the country if they are participating in wars that are beneficial to the UK. And an interesting case was the Manchester attacks, where that guy apparently was allowed, and he, the MI, MI5 were in contact with him. Right. Now this, bro, you touch upon this in your book, this to the average listener is like, what? Mm -hmm. No, surely... Britain is not allowing people to go in and out when there is a war of, war on terror internally. <laughs> You've got to break this down, bro, because I mean, look, it the, sounds like the hypocrisy. Is, the thing is that, that, yeah. that that's very normal. It's very normal. Like at the time that John Bolton, so one -off. literally John Bolton's in front of the UN saying that Syria, Libya, North Korea, they're all part, part of the axis of evil, right? When he was the um, US ambassador to the UN. He's saying this, they're part of the, this axis of evil. At that same time, the Americans are handing over the Canadian citizen, Mahar Arar, to the Syrian authorities to, to torture and interrogate him. So, like, they're making one big statement publicly, but behind the scenes, in the war on terror, they're all cooperating, you know, for um, the British people. You know, they, the, many of them will have a very strong memory of the killing of the police uh, woman, Yvonne Fletcher. Um, from, so... Yeah, in the 1980s, um, Yvonne Fletcher was killed by the Libyans and that, like, uh, was somebody in the Libyan embassy and that resulted in this very tense relationship between Libya and the UK for many, many years. In fact, Libya was seen as this kind of, like, Gaddafi's regime in particular, as this evil that could never be, you know, worked with. And, you know, hundreds of dissidents were coming in and out of the UK, many yeah. of them... So many Libyan dissidents were granted um, asylum in the UK, um, specifically with the intention to work against the Gaddafi regime. Um, but then Tony Blair enters into this weird relationship with Gaddafi at some point to do trade deals and so on and so forth. But then it came with a security deal. So now, next thing we know, we find out that Tony Blair's uh, government uh, or administration okayed rendition and torture of certain Libyans that the Gaddafi regime was interested in with the complicity of of um, MI6 and that a whole group of dissidents that were welcomed here to the UK to do anti-Gaddafi activities 
were now being labelled as Al-Qaeda terrorists and were being deported back to Libya under secret courts. So they're being de- deported back to Gaddafi. Secret courts? Yeah, we have secret courts here in the UK. Like, you can't see the evidence against you. Yeah, we've had them since since the year 2000. Conspiracy theory, yeah? No. Shall I bring the foil hat? No, this is this is the reality that people go through. But why have I never had a secret court before? Um, not sure, bro. They they exist. If is it you, mainstream, generally mainstream gen- media? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mainstream media talks even, about it. Yeah, I gotta say, even the Daily Mail did a campaign against uh, an extension of the laws that would allow for even more secrecy within the courts. But yeah, wow. if you if you're accused, that's against it's, democracy, though, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, and if you're accused rights. of uh, of terrorism. Uh, or terrorism related activities for certain types of offences not offences, for certain types of sanctions, like if they put you on a deportation order, if they try to extradite you from the country if they take your passport away from you, if they remove your citizenship from you if they take your children away from you in any of these types of cases the government can say we want to present our evidence in secret and the court uh, is obliged to uh, to listen to the government in a um, or, or is obliged to to hear out the government and if it's convinced that the government should be allowed to provide its evidence a secret then you will be excluded from the room and so will your lawyer while the government presents evidence against uh, against you you won't know what that evidence is well if it just goes to the judge yo we want to get rid of this guy if you don't listen to us mate well you have to just trust that the judge is being fair and honest right I think you've uh, answered my last point, which is I was going to ask for solutions, but mashallah, you've intertwined it so well exactly. in what you've been, uh, what we've been discussing throughout. I mean, to put it very succinct, at the end of the book, you mentioned three things. You you say um, knowledge, mm-hmm. uh, communication, and you say community. Have I missed? Uh, yeah, I, th- I say there's effectively uh, three sites of of, of our, our resistance, right? To um, or three sites of disobedience. Oh, so okay. we should be disobedient in our language. So we shouldn't accept language about us that is inaccurate. So, Which is what we started with. So, for example, like use of the word Islamist, for example, uh, like we have a fourteen hundred year Islamic tradition. The word Islamist that does not come from that tradition. We should describe ourselves and phenomena that exist within our tradition, even if it's from phenomena that we disagree with. But we shouldn't allow for other people to use, you know, kind of language that suits them to mm. describe us. Yeah, right. Just don't accept terminologies like that. Yeah, we should be disobedient in the the way that they construct knowledge about us too. So we should construct our own knowledge, and we should understand the world from our own perspective what rather than. So, like for example, uh, Muslims are a, are a threat to society, right? They produce knowledge that 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 informs people about who we are. We should produce our own knowledge to say, well, actually, no, we're not. But knowledge it, meaning statistics or data, literature, literature okay. everything, right? We should okay. be pro- producers of our own knowledge. And the last one is that we should be disobedient through our communities. And by, by that, it means coming together. It means actually working with one another by not accepting, you know, kind of false boundaries between one another about who is a good Muslim and who is a bad Muslim. You know, these kind of false binaries that are set up at a governmental level, right? We should actually be coming together and working with one another. Hmm. So False binaries set at a governmental level. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting that you mentioned that. Do you mean in... In the sense of that's how governments identify us. Yeah, that's right. Like, you know, the good Muslim is the pacified Muslim, the the weak one, the one who, oh, you know, okay. um, rejects large portions of their faith and, you know, largely is completely secular in their outlook. Mm. Right. So rejecting the notion that that is a good Muslim and that we are bad Muslims until we become like that. We should reject that. You know, so it's important that we understand that Islam is a communal religion. It's practiced as a, as, a, as a community. We have other communities as well that we, you know, work with, that we have friendships with, and so on and so forth. But ultimately, you know, we have um, 
we have a bond that's that's based on a love of Allah, which is something that's just is it is remarkable when you think about it. Uh, Subhanallah. Jazakallah khair, bro. Barakallah for a uh, very enlightening discussion and talk where we have covered loads of things. And uh, if you like what you've heard, even if you haven't, get it anyway and definitely do check it out. Don't be cheap and get the PDF because... <laughs> I don't even know if there's a PDF out there, but yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, like, it's probably being made as we. <laughs> inshallah, none of the none of the profits go to me. Inshallah, everything goes goes towards Cage in the end. So, Alhamdulillah. You know, please. Uh, so please it's a support. charity thing. Inshallah, inshallah, okay. it will always be charity. Let's let's uh, add some more reviews. Purchase it five star, and more reviews. Jazakallah khair, bro. Inshallah, we will touch base again. And uh, check the brother out. I'll put your socials in the description, inshallah. Yeah, You're on Instagram, Twitter mostly. And Facebook, yeah. Facebook. But inshallah, don't forget to uh, like, comment and subscribe. And uh, yeah, we'll see you guys next time, inshallah. inshallah. Salaamu alaikum.